So welcome to the 57th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Ulrich Heinz. He is a distinguished university professor at Ohio State University. He got his PhD in 1980 from Goethe University in Frankfurt. He had several postdoctoral positions, including uh, one at Yale University between 1980 and 1982. He uh, was a research assistant at Goethe University for a year and then became a visiting assistant professor at Vanderbilt University in uh, 1983. He became an assistant physicist at Brookhaven National Lab, uh, was promoted to associate physicist and, and was there until 1987, at which point he moved to University of Regensburg as a professor. And he was also uh, in part um, a staff member at CERN until 2000. In uh, 2000, he uh, became a full professor at Ohio State University where he is uh, remaining until now. Over the years, he received many uh, honors and awards. I will not be able to probably mention them all. Let me briefly uh, just highlight a few of them. He had a uh, Gerard Haas Prize from Deutsche Forschung Gemeinschaft in 1988 for five years. He became a fellow of American Physical Society in 2001, fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2005, he received, and I always uh, like to mention that, it's very important, outstanding referee from the American Physical Society. Uh, it's a very important service to the community, as everybody knows. And he had a Humboldt uh, Research Award in 2018. He also uh, served on many editorial boards. Uh, to mention a few, uh, he was an editor-in-chief uh, at Commons on Nuclear and Particle Physics between 90. Uh, 1999 to 2018. He is an associate editor of Nuclear Physics A since 2000, and he served on the editorial board of Physica Scripta, Scripta between 2013 and 2018. He served on many national and international committees uh, at DOE, NSF, uh, Institute for Nuclear Theory National Advisory Committee, many other things. His research interests are extremely wide. I'm not going to mention everything. He's definitely one of the leaders in theoretical nuclear physics. He works on coagulant plasma in relativistic heavy ion collisions, hydrodynamics of non-abelian plasmas, thermal field theory, uh, many other techniques and uh, properties of coagulant plasma. And today he will be talking about hydrodynamics for heavy ion collision collisions, startup status, and recent developments. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Uli. Thank you very much for this generous introduction. Um, I am very happy to speak in this uh, uh, series. I think it's a wonderful thing that you have done for the community, uh, the good side of the pandemic uh, showing up here. I'm a little sorry that I was only able to listen to a few of the colloquia before because of conflicts with my teaching schedule. And this is all the reason why this talk is only now in the semester, uh, in, the, in the summer term where I don't have to teach. So um, I want to talk about recent developments and the status of hydrodynamics for heavy ion collisions. And before I even start, I would like to point out that most of what I will show here is based on work that was done with my students and postdocs, specifically with Dennis Bezo, who graduated a couple of years ago, my present uh, postdoc, Chandra Doichadopadhyay, Nipei Du, who is very, very busy right now writing his own thesis, Derek Everett, who defended his thesis two or three weeks ago, Kevin Inglis, Stan Leonaga, former postdoc Maurizio Martinez, and Mike McNellis, who also defended his thesis uh, two or three weeks ago. And so uh, some of what you will see is also taken from these theses, but I also found out that I don't have enough time to, to tell you everything that's contained in all these theses. So uh, uh, for some of that stuff, you may want to have me back at some later time. All right, now comes the question. Okay, this is just for navigation in case you want to get uh, quicker access to the individual contributions in my talk later on on your own. Uh, let me start right away with the overview. 
And I always like to show this beautiful uh, picture of the Little Bang that was created by my former student Chun Chen uh, already five or six years ago, um, which um, illustrates key features of the of a heavy iron collision. And also, when when I discuss it, you will see that it has. Uh, conceptual similarities with what happened in the Big Bang. So there is a lot of uh, things that happened in the Big Bang that also happened in the Little Bang on different time scales and in different, somewhat different relative hierarchies. But uh, you can recognize the ideas that you find in Weinberg's book on cosmology. Uh, you can recognize them here when we discuss uh, relativistic heavy ion collisions. In, 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 in Rick physics, uh, the Everything starts with two highly accelerated nuclei that are uh, moving close to the speed of light and therefore Lorentz contracted to thin disks, as you can see here on the left side. And then they collide at some impact parameter that you have no control over. And as they pass through each other, they lose a fraction of their beam energy, which is deposited in the collision zone and creates new matter, which uh, undergoes some far off equilibrium dynamics for about one Fermi over C of time. And by that time, it settles down to a state that is uh, not in, but sufficiently close to thermal, local thermal equilibrium that you can describe it macroscopically with uh, viscous hydrodynamics. It's still off equilibrium and it actually never reaches completely thermal equilibrium in a heavy iron collision, but viscous hydrodynamics, which accounts for deviations uh, from equilibrium can uh, very well handle that uh, uh, evolution. At some point uh, through the hydrodynamic evolution, which is mostly an expansion, both along the beam direction, but also very importantly transverse to the beam direction, the system cools down. And once it reaches the critical temperature for um, where the quark gluon plasma phase can no longer exist and the quarks and gluons have to reconfine into hadrons. You go through the so-called hadronization phase transition, which at high energies is a, is a smooth crossover, rapid crossover phase transition, but at lower energies and large baryon densities may turn into a first order phase transition. We don't know that yet. After that, the system exists in the form of hadrons, which still interact with each other. Uh, but less and less so until they freeze out. That's the so-called uh, stage of kinetic freeze out. And then after that, they just stream freely to the detector if they are stable. And if they are unstable, they decay into stable particles, which then free stream into the detector. Uh, <clears throat> at the hadronization point, the chemical composition of that hadron gas is more or less settled and fixed. And then, um, six, seven, eight, 10 Fermi over C later, you have basically reached the kinetic freeze out stage at which then also the energies and the momenta of the particles are uh, fixed. Um, I will mostly talk about this stage of viscous hydrodynamic evolution. And uh, in particular, the, uh, the refinements that have occurred there recently in response to the challenge posed by the uh, Rick beam energy scan, where uh, collisions were uh, performed at the lower end of collision energies that is accessible by, um, by the relativistic heavy ion collider with the goal of finding the critical point. But uh, there are um, other aspects of this, which are also uh, very interesting and very interesting evolutions have happened in, the, in, in recent time. For example, um, one of the questions is how do you get from the point of impact to the, um, to the hydrodynamic stage? What happens in this far off equilibrium stage? And there, at the moment, what models, many models implement are uh, a stage of approximate free streaming of partons, uh, which is then matched to a hydrodynamic form of the energy momentum tensor. But uh, we have developed recently a three, three plus one dimensional version of anisotropic hydrodynamics, which is specifically formulated to handle very large longitudinal transverse pressure asymmetries as they occur in this far off equilibrium stage. And this code can actually start running at uh, from times of less than 0.1 Fermi over C, 0.05 Fermi over C without crashing and without breaking down physics wise. And that's something that I had to take out from this uh, talk and um, maybe talk about at a later stage. 
Another interesting question is um, how do I get back from the hydrodynamic macroscopic hydrodynamic description of the collision to a gas of hadrons with with energies of momenta because after all this is what the experiments measure they find particles and they identify their masses and they identify they measure their energies and their momenta and this is all the information that the experiment provides and this is the information that theory has to give has to provide too if you want to make a direct comparison with the experimental data this is the so called particleization procedure where you turn output from hydrodynamics, which is essentially the 10 components of the energy momentum tensor and the four components of the baryon, uh, net baryon current, four current. How do you uh, turn that into momentum distributions? Uh, the, these hydrodynamic uh, components mo are moments of the phase space distribution that uh, take moments over the momentum distribution. So, uh, you don't get the full momentum distribution, you just get 14 moments of the momentum distribution out of hydrodynamics, which leaves you a large degree of ambiguity of how you assign the momentum distributions um, that uh, they are only very imperfectly constrained by these four moments. And so this leaves an, in principle, unresolvable theoretical ambiguity there because you don't have first principle guidance on how to calculate these momentum distributions without actually evolving them directly, which dynamics avoids. And uh, so we developed, uh, we, we, we did some studies on how sensitive, for example, um, transport, uh, Transport, transport properties of the quark gluon plasma that are extracted from comparison, comparison with experimental data are affected by this uncertainty. And we also interest, uh, developed an interesting new version of the particleization procedure, which is called maximum entropy, where we use only the information that comes out of hydrodynamics and nothing more uh, to constrain, uh, to, to, to give the most likely form of the particle. Uh, momentum distribution. And again, this is something that was done by Derek Everett in his thesis, but I will not be able to talk about. What I will talk about is on uh, aspects that uh, address the additional complexities in this picture when you model heavy ion collisions at lower energies, at beam energy scan uh, type of energies. The most important uh, difference there is that the um, the, the Lorentz contraction is no longer as drastic as indicated in this sketch here. They are no longer con, uh, 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 pancakes, but somewhat compressed ellipsoids. And so there is a non-trivial interpenetration and energy deposition uh, dynamics, which is intrinsically three plus one dimensional. It extends over finite uh, time intervals and it has interesting space time structures that you have to resolve. Uh, it, it breaks boost invariance from the beginning, uh, which is a simplification that is usually um, used with much profit in, uh, hydro, in the hydrodynamic simulations at higher energies. Um, it requires an equation of state at zero strangeness, but non-zero net charges for barrier number and electric charge. It needs to account for the non-equilibrium dynamics of uh, other conserved charges, like the, uh, I mean, of the conserved charges in the strong interaction, the barrier number, the electric charge and the strangeness. Um, the, the goal of the beam energy scan is to find and identify the QCD critical point that, uh, with, for which there are strong theoretical uh, motivations uh, to expect that it's there, but we don't know whether it is and we want to find it. And when you have such a critical point, it will affect the evolution by critical dynamics uh, near the critical point, critical fluctuations, critical slowing down of their evolution uh, and their hydrodynamization. And once you have these fluctuations and you know that you have to take them into account on top of the hydrodynamic evolution, they can feed back into the hydrodynamic evolution and they might modify the hydrodynamic evolution. And all of that uh, is, is, opens a lot of questions and those have been addressed in the last few years and some of the work that we have done to address them, I want to take, tell, tell about today. So that was the overview. So let's jump right away into the first issue, the dynamical initialization. So here, 
on the left, you see something like we saw in this nice uh, colorful picture from Chun Chen. But when you decrease the energy from top brick energy to about a tenth of that, then the same picture looks like that. You see there, the Lorentz contraction is much less efficient. Um, the, they are not contracted in the longitudinal direction nearly as far. And so when you look at in a space and time diagram where the uh, Z is the beam direction and T is time, uh, you have, a, uh, you have Lorentz compressed length of one nucleus and Lorentz compressed length of the other nucleus, depending on where you are in the transverse plane. These lengths vary with the, uh, with the transverse position and they are finite. And that means interaction happens in, in this entire rectangle. And inside that entire rectangle is where the energy deposition, which is taken out of the beam energy of the two nuclei and put into the uh, medium at mid rapidity uh, where that is being generated. And uh, this is a plot from a paper by Chun Chen and, and Björn Schenke, which shows that the maximum time it takes for the two nuclei to penetrate each other when you go to the center of the axis in a zero impact parameter collision can be as large as several Fermi, three, four Fermi's uh, when you go to the energy regime that is these days, maybe actually today being probed at uh, Brookhaven at the relativistic heavy ion collider. And so, um, the energy deposition is no longer sudden and at some fixed longitudinal proper time. It's complicated and it depends on the transverse position and it's intrinsically three plus one dimensional in structure. And uh, this causes a number of challenges. Um, in particular, there are, it turns out there are really large model uncertainties uh, related to the uh, way baryons are being stopped. I mean, take the baryons of the two incoming nuclei. Um, at high energies, we always assume that they just pass through each other. And what we see at mid rapidity is not contaminated at all from with baryon number brought in, in uh, from the projectiles. But here, uh, some fraction of that baryon number will be getting stopped into the region, the mid rapidity region that is accessible experimentally. And there are very large uncertainties in the space time structure of this baryon structure, of this baryon stopping. And uh, the, the interface between pre hydrodynamics, whatever dynamics is going on before the system can be described as a fluid, and hydrodynamics has to occur dynamically and has a three plus one dimensional structure. And this has generated a lot of uh, activity, just a few words, uh, works are quoted here in the last few years. So um, just to illustrate uh, some, of the, some of the things that are less uh, contentious and some of the things where we have large model and model differences, I show you here the distribution in tau on the vertical axis and the space-time rapidity on the horizontal axis. In the dynamical initialization model that we developed at, at Ohio State by, with my student uh, Lipe Du, where we take uh, URQMD uh, and, this, and the breaking of strings as described in URQMD without any rescattering that you have in URQMD to figure out where the particles uh, are first formed uh, for a collision at 20 GeV and at 200 GeV here on the right. Uh, I compare that with similar plots from a string-like model that was developed by Shannon Schenke. Uh, again, tau versus eta s. And in this case, the, the, the lines indicate the strings and the dots are the ends of the strings where they actually uh, have baryons, uh, create baryons. The baryons are not uh, explicitly denoted up here. And what you see when you go to high energies, it is indeed not a bad approximation as long as you stay near mid rapidity to assume that all the matter is produced in a delta function like process at a fixed formation time, uh, more so in the string model, maybe somewhat more um, more diffuse in the URGMD model. But once you go to 10 times lower energies, uh, the assumption of particle production happening instantaneously is just completely wrong. 
So that means that uh, when you write down the conservation laws for energy momentum and barrier number, which is usually the starting point for a, for a fluid dynamical description, you actually have initially fluid and particles coexisting. Uh, so the particles are uh, being produced by, from the fragmentation of the strings uh, or by the URQMD mechanism. And then at some point, the, these particles uh, become part of the fluid, fluiditize. And at that point, the energy gets fed into the fluid and then further propagated in the fluid by hydrodynamic equations after that. So when you write down these conservation laws and um, write the particle and fluid parts on different sides, you get source terms for the fluid um, that are given by um, the, the particle component of the energy momentum tensor and its, uh, and its disappearance as a function of time. And so the particle uh, component of the energy momentum tensor and baryon current can be written uh, in these kinetic forms here, where K is some smearing function, some smearing kernel, some something of a Gaussian Gaussian form, R I of T describes the trajectories of the particles, and then here is uh, some Gaussian ansatz with the time structure that I will show you in the next slide, which can be written covariantly. So you, this is it's it's more instructive to look at it in the in the rest frame of the particle but you can write it covariantly. And this theta function is a smeared out uh, heavy side function, which says after some formation time, tau uh, formation, uh, the particles cease to be particles and become part of the fluid. And uh, the sharp, sharp transition would be this blue line of what we impose is a, a hyperbolic tangent transition with, uh, with the duration of the fluidization process of two times delta tau thermal to, to, to avoid uh, overly large gradients. And so when you implement that and then uh, show uh, plot the energy momentum uh, source uh, that feeds the hydrodynamic fluid uh, as a function of time. So here I show the plot for the energy momentum source and for the baryon number source on the right side at an early time of half a Fermi over C. Um, so you see some, some Gaussian lumps here. Some of these look more like ellipses. That's because they are moving uh, very, the, the sources are, the Gaussians are moving very fast and get Lorentz contraction along the direction of their motion. And then as things follow, uh, as time evolves, uh, it evolves like that. And at later times, uh, more, more of the faster hadrons form at later times. And that means at later times, you see more of these uh, ellipsoidal uh, shapes of the sources than at earlier times. It's almost like a microlensing event from, from, from Hubble that you see here. Okay, so um, you, you do run into a technical problem that- Quick uh, question, yeah. Three yes. data or simulations? This is simulations. Okay, this, thank this you. Is, no, we would, we would love to be able to see that, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we don't have a Hubble telescope that can shine on the first half of Fermi over C of a heavy ion collision, unfortunately. Uh, technically, uh, these very compressed ellipses uh, lead to large gradients, so you have to regulate this. Uh, I'm not going to discuss this in any, in any way. So we can compare this with, uh, with similar um, plots that can that were constructed by Chun Chen in his uh, from his string model and you can see similarities in character uh, one key difference I would like to point out is that in the string model the energy and the baryons come from are associated by strings so the transverse positions uh, of the lumpiness of the energy deposition and of the baryon number deposition are highly correlated with, with each other. As you can see here, there is no such correlation in, in our model. And we don't know how important that is yet uh, in full simulations, but I just wanted to point that out. Now, a, a, a key factor that is maybe not fully appreciated yet by everybody is uh, that the initial deposition of in, 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 in low energy collisions is likely not, is definitely not boost invariant. And in particular in this URQMD based model that we used, uh, the initial deposition is very short range in space-time rapidity. 
that's the that's the space-time repetitivity with with this rectangle in which the two nuclei overlap exists, and all the particles with large positive and all the way to large negative repetitivities are created in this narrow eta s range. So this is the boost invariant line y equals eta, and you see this is not this is completely off that line. Now, these particles move left at very high velocities, and these move right at very high velocities. So as you, as you wait, just free streaming will tilt this uh, region and it will make it align with the uh, boost invariant line y equals eta s at later times. This happens within about half a Fermi over c when you do, the, when you do this at 200 GeV which is a typical starting time for hydrodynamics. So the assumption of boost invariance initial conditions in hydrodynamics is actually well-founded at these high energies. But when you go to 20 GeV, you see there are significant differences uh, from boost invariance and you, you cannot assume boost invariance with any kind of accuracy. Um, depending on how long you allow for this free streaming before it becomes part of the, um, because before it comes part of the fluid, you have different y eta correlations um, as the initial condition for your hydrodynamics. And this is one of the large model uncertainties that, that we have in this uh, lower energy regime is uh, the, it's caused by the unknown uh, time it takes for the particles to thermalize and become part of the fluid. Uh, what I showed you before was for the energy density, the same holds here for the baryon, net baryon density, which is shown in these plots. And I compare what we get from this URQMD-like initial, uh, initialization with the string model initial conditions from, uh, from Shen and Schenke. Uh, the main point is there, they have a hole here between the uh, projectile-like and the target-like uh, baryon uh, number production. Um, which and, and this hole gets bigger at, uh, at high energies, whereas this URQMD model fills in this hole. There is no gap here in between, not even at 200 GeV, there is a gap, it's, it's much wider. So the space-time structure, the rapidity structure may be very similarly, similar, but the space-time structure is rather different in these two models. All right, so that's one point that I wanted to focus on that there are uh, the initial conditions of baryon number uh, sourcing in the hydrodynamics is, uh, has uncertainties. Now, what, does, what happens with baryon number after it has been put into the uh, fluid? Here are the, um, the hydrodynamic equations after all the particles have disappeared and become part of the fluid. So now there's only one fluid component of the energy momentum tensor. And it's decomposed in the standard way where this is the local energy density, this is the equilibrium pressure, pi is a bulk viscous correction to the equilibrium pressure and little pi is the shear stress, uh, pressure components caused by shear viscosity. And the baryon number, you have the baryon flow with the momentum flow, which is this part. And then you have a so-called baryon diffusion current, which, which manifests as a net baryon current in the local rest frame, uh, which is defined, de de defined by momentum flow. And so if you want to solve these, um, you need compared to um, the hydrodynamics that's being used at higher energies, you need additional ingredients. So the first thing you need is you now need an equation of state that depends on both energy and net baryon number. And, um, and we need in principle even to, 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 to include multiple conserved charges, not, not just baryon number, but also strangeness and electric charge. What's shown here is an example from the uh, beam energy scan theory collaboration uh, by Paolo Parotto. Uh, who uh, developed such an equation of state based on extrapolations from lattice QCD data to the finite chemical potential domain. And it shows here the speed of sound squared with the phase transition as this valley where the speed of sound drops and it's high and it rises to one third, square root of one third at high chemical potential and it also rises again below the phase transition. And you can add to that a critical point, uh, which was also done by the best collaboration. 
The other thing that you need is transport coefficients that uh, depend not only on temperature, but also in, on uh, chemical potential. And so people have worked on parameterization of the shear viscosity and bulk viscosity uh, per entropy density as a function of both mu and T. There is a few references here. Um, uh, there, what I show here on the right-hand side is the um, a baryon diffusion coefficient for the baryon, uh, uh, the baryon diffusion coefficient, the diagonal term in the baryon diffusion coefficient matrix Kij that corresponds to baryon number. This is from a model that is based on kinetic theory in the relaxation time approximation. This is for the same event, the uh, ca calculation from a holographic model. You see this one has a, a free parameter uh, called C, CB that controls the absolute height of these uh, plots here, which was adjusted to look similar to this model here. But you also see that this one is more, um, has, has more gradients, higher gradients in the, uh, in, in, in the baryon diffusion coefficient than the holographic model. And so, and, and then you, there are some works that actually calculate the entire matrix here, also the off diagonal uh, components that couple strangeness diffusion to baryon diffusion to charge diffusion and so on. Uh, and last not least, you need a hydrodynamic code that can do all of this. Uh, so you need three plus one dimensional hydrodynamic simulation with conserved currents and in principle, multiple conserved currents. At the moment, we have, what we have are two codes that have been fully tested, at least two codes that have been fully tested for including baryon current, but uh, we don't have a code yet that, that uh, um, propagates simultaneously uh, baryon current, strangeness and electric current. Although I know people are working on that in Frankfurt, Jan Fotakis is working on that. And I'm sure elsewhere people are also working on that. And then you need to make sure that these codes work properly. And what I show you here is a comparison for some test configurations between these two codes, music and best hydro. There are dashed lines and solid lines. One corresponds to one model, the other corresponds to the other model and you cannot distinguish them, which is how we want it. Um, I would like to emphasize that it's really important uh, that you validate these codes because we are in a stage of uh, a scientific uh, study of quark gluon plasma where we aim for precision rather than qualitative discovery. And you cannot do precision uh, analysis of experimental data unless you have precision codes that, sim that, that perform the simulations. And so code validation is needed for quantitative work. And we have to understand where the code reaches the limits and where it starts to break down uh, so that we can beware of not running it where we shouldn't be, or at least monitoring what's going on if we run it where we, where we really shouldn't. And, uh, and, and also numerical precision should not, should not be the limiting factor in comparison with data. And so here's one example of what we do um, if we want to test the uh, precision of the part of the code that describes transverse evolution, transverse flow. You can, there is fortunately a, a, an analytic model called Gupse flow, which describes the simultaneous expansion, boost invariant expansion along the beam direction coupled to a uh, asymmetrically symmetric transverse expansion, very rapid transverse expansion with large gradients. So it's a very demanding test for the codes. And one of them is, can be solved by Mathematica, a simple ordinary differential equation in, uh, a, in, a, in a funny coordinate called Gupse coordinate, Gupse radius rho or Gupse time rho. And the other is three, dimen three plus one dimensional BES hydro. And again, one is the exact solution, the other the numerical. And you really have to look carefully to see any sort of discrepancy here at all. Mostly it's, it's just a very, very good agreement between the two approaches. Uh, to test the longitudinal dynamics, you can do uh, 
you can turn off the transverse gradient and just look at the rapidity evolution. And here is an example of looking at the baryon density profile. This is an initial profile in space-time rapidity that we give the system. Then as a function of time, the density drops basically like one over tau. This is what you see here. But also because you have gradients in the baryon density, you have corresponding large gradients in the chemical potential. The gradients in the chemical potential drive a baryon diffusion current, which is plotted here, um, uh, where, the, where the gradient goes down, the diffusion current is positive, where the gradient goes up, the diffusion current is negative. And um, this is the eta component of that diffusion current, and that's the tau component uh, for that diffusion current. And again, one is, can be, this model, this, this configuration can be self analytically and compared with numerics and you see perfect agreement between the two. And then there is a number of additional validation protocols that we have invented to test the various other aspects of the code. And if you want the details, you just go to the GitHub, you click on that link, it gets you to a GitHub page where the code is deposited and all the protocols are described. And so there is an, a, a long um, computer physics communication article which documents the code apps, uh, that was too fast. And then on the GitHub, you find the user manual that uh, tells you how to use everything in the code, including the, um, including the verification protocols, which you should always check. If you do something to the code, you should make sure that it still goes, passes the validation co code. So what does baryon diffusion do? Um, so the baryon diffusion, which is this, this dissipative effect that describes a non-zero baryon current in the momentum rest frame of the fluid. Um, it's controlled by a relaxation uh, type of uh, equation, which says that n mu would like to approach its Navier-Stokes value, which is given by the gradient of the baryon chemical potential normalized by the temperature multiplied with the transport coefficient called baryon diffusion, baryon diffusion coefficient. And we set it uh, proportional to some, some constant B, which we can use to check it up or down by hand in order to check the sensitivity to the magnitude of the uh, baryon diffusion coefficient. And it also has temperature and chemical potential dependence, but there is an overall scale factor, which we vary. And uh, uh, in, a, some, in some plots, you will see curves for, for, for various values of this. So here is a case where some, Trento-like initial condition for the energy density and for the um, for the baryon density is uh, taken. In this case, uh, both of them are calculated from the nuclear thickness function. So these two uh, profiles are directly correlated with each other. This would not be the case in this URQMD based dynamical immunization model if we use that here. And then we evolve it with only shear viscous effects turned on or shear viscous and diffusion effects turned on. And when you look uh, here, you see that the shear effects really smear out the bumps in the energy distribution. But when you turn on additionally diffusion, you can hardly see a difference between these two plots. So baryon diffusion has very little effect on the energy density profile. However, when you look at the baryon density profile, uh, again, shear viscosity smears out, smears this out to a large extent, but then there is significant additional smearing coming from the baryon diffusion current. And uh, this is also illustrated here um, in for a toy initial condition that we took from one of Denikol's paper. And we plot here as a function of space-time rapidity, the energy density profile initially and at some later time of 10 Fermi over C. Uh, we plot tau times E, which decreases because the energy density, even in ideal fluid dynamics, goes like one over tau to the four third, not like one over tau, whereas baryon density goes like one over tau. So it's basically staying flat as a function of time uh, when you plot rho B times tau. And you see different curves here in different colors for different choices of the baryon diffusion coefficient, the holographic model or the kinetic model with three different, very different values of this constant CB. It makes no difference on the energy density profile whatsoever, but it does make a difference in the baryon density profile. The baryon diffusion 
fills in the holes between these two initial peaks because uh, the baryon density create the baryon chemical potential gradients leads to a baryon diffusion flow this way here, that way here, this way here, and that way here, always outward from the gradient. And you can see that depending on how large this baryon diffusion coefficient is, this effect is weaker or stronger. For a larger baryon diffusion coefficient, you get more filling in of the mid-rapidity valley than for a small baryon diffusion coefficient. The holographic model is more or less equivalent to this one, uh, to the kinetic model with CB equals one. So baryon diffusion leaves no pronounced signatures in the evolution of the energy density but it smoothes out gradients in baryon density. And this is a, a very active topic. Many other groups are working on stuff like that. And it's, it's being worked on as we work on now. Now here is an interesting study by Fotakis from a year or two ago, where he looked at this, at the effects of cross diffusion coefficients uh, of the fact that you have non-diagonal elements in the, uh, diffusion coefficient matrix between the chemical potential for baryon number, for strangeness, and for electric charge. And what's plotted on the left-hand side is the baryon density times tau, and on the right-hand side is plotted the strange, net strangeness density by times tau. And the first uh, plot shows what happens when you have no diffusion effects at all, so there is some bimodal, I mean, two-peak structure in eta of, as of the baryon density, zero net strangeness everywhere as initial condition. And if you have no diffusion, this doesn't change as a function of time. You have a little bit of dynamics here. When you turn on baryon diffusion in the baryon density distribution, you fill in the, the valleys here and make it spread out. But uh, if you have no cross coupling here, strangeness remains of course, constant at zero and flat. And then when you turn on the off diagonal elements, then the dynamics, the, the, the dynamics in the baryon diffusion cross feeds into dynamics of strangeness diffusion and you develop uh, inhomogeneities, negative and positive balancing overall uh, strange regions as a result of this cross correlation. But look at the absolute scale here. This is the density that you can generate plus or minus in the strangeness compared to this density in the baryon density, there is a factor of 50 between them. And so that means that uh, these induced effects are very small compared to the major effects that you get from the diagonal terms. There is no code yet that fully implements that in, in a fully hydrodynamic code, but this is on the way. Uh, where am I with time here? I have another 15 minutes or so. Don't worry about it. Yes, something like that. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, I'm going to show you some uh, comparison with beam energy scan data. This is mostly coming from a recent paper by, by Shannon Alsrani in, in Wayne State, um, which built on earlier papers of his and, and Danny Call, but it does not have the dynamic in, initialization built in. Um, it takes into account that uh, when you look at the collision of the two, uh, um, two nuclei at finite impact parameter, then um, on one side, you have a lot of projectile matter hitting very little target matter. And so the overall momentum goes this way. On the other side, you have a lot of target, project, target uh, nucleus matter hitting very little projectile matter. So the matter goes that way. So that means there is a center of momentum rapidity of the matter, which depends on transverse position, which is, uh, which is proportional to the difference of the nuclear matter thickness of nucleus A and nucleus B at that transverse position. And then the energy density is, this is the cosh, cosh of the rapidity associated with that center of momentum and uh, with, the, with the effective mass of the matter at that transverse position, which is again calculated from the nuclear thickness functions by some formula like this here. And I just want to point out that this is uh, for, for sufficiently high energies, this scales like one over root TA dB, which is also what is assumed in the Trentone model. Uh, but at lower energies, the scaling gets broken. As you can see, these other terms here become important. 
And uh, the, the one big simplification that this model still does, it assumes a boost invariant in initial longitudinal flow velocity profile, which I showed you is not a good, not a well-motivated assumption, but it's being done here to, um, to simplify things. And so here is, a, I show you now a couple of, a number of plots that compare data with uh, calculations from this model. Uh, this is Phobos data from, um, from 20 years ago at 200 GeV, 63 GeV, uh, 20 GeV gold gold at RIC, the rapidity distributions of the charge hadrons uh, for a range of centralities, and basically everything looks fine. Um, then at lower energies recently, the beam energy scan energy is here. Um, there were at the point when this paper was published only mid rapidity data available and uh, for different energies and different impact parameters, everything looks kind of uh, okay. Um, this is the da old data from the SPS at 17.3 and 8.7 GeV in the center of mass lead lead where they have uh, additional uh, data, not just at mid rapidity, but over an entire rapidity window. Again, different centralities at these two energies, both of these two energies, everything looks kind of okay. But now let's look at the net proton minus antiproton rapidity distributions. Uh, the green curves are the predictions. When you look at the mid rapidity data from star, uh, it kind of gets these mid rapidity data very well. But when you look at the rapidity distribution measured by Brahms for 200 GeV, which is this brown points, it doesn't lie anywhere on this black line. And you look at the blue points here and they look kind of closer on the red line, but also not, not perfectly. So here the rapidity distribution of the, of the baryons is, is coming out as, um, as a problem, as a potential problem. Uh, these are other data from the beam energy scan. At mid rapidity, everything looks kind of okay. Um, here are the proton, not net proton, but the proton distributions at the SPS. Uh, it looks not completely disastrous, but it's uh, in the more peripheral collisions, you see there is some weaknesses. Um, uh, I will show you one thing where it completely fails in the next slide. This is now uh, <clears throat> just a quick slide about the importance of uh, chemical potential dependence on the transport coefficients. If you look at the elliptic flow, which is generally assumed to have a very direct link to the shear viscosity, and you just take the a constant shear viscosity of uh, eta over s of 0.1, close to 1 over 4 pi, you really over predict the data significantly. If you allow for the standard type of temperature dependence uh, rising at high temperature, both at low temperature, both sides from the critical point, uh, it improves things a little bit, but not dramatically. But if you, uh, you have to account for baryon number dependence, and there is a particular parameterization that's given in that paper, which is factored into the ADA S in order to bring the theory down to what, where it is measured. Now, here are directed flow data, and this is where things get, um, get hairy, uh, especially at large backward and forward rapidities. You see that the theoretically predicted slopes here do not agree between the blue shaded and blue uh, dotted curves. And um, so this, this problem is bigger at lower energies than at higher energies. At higher energies, the agreement is better. At lower energies, it gets worse, gets worse. And if that's for pion directed flow, and if you look at proton directed flow, it's just an absolute disaster. Yeah? The, the data are, show very little between minus one and one in terms of di directed flow. And the model gives a very strong one, which tells you that there is something wrong in the way the baryon number is distributed that generates a very large uh, directed flow, which is not there in the data. So as a summary of the status of these kinds of approaches with relative vis-a-vis -vis data, is I would say that many systematic features of hadron production data as a function of beam energy and collision centrality of transverse and longitudinal momentum are qualitatively well described in this approach, except for anything that has to do with net baryons and protons. Uh, rapidity distributions and net proton flow are um, 
very badly described. And we really need a better understanding of longitudinal initial conditions and baryon stopping. Uh, because if you have the, the wrong initial conditions, you will get the wrong final physics out of there. That's where this stands. Now, the last uh, maybe 10 minutes of my talk, I would like to talk about uh, <clears throat> the effects uh, of, or the dynamics of critical fluctuations um, in low energy hydrodynamics. Um, when you search for a critical point, one of the features that you search for is critical dynamics. A critical point features large fluctuations and correlations that's known for since the 1970s. And um, depend, there is a correlation length associated with these fluctuations and the dependence of, the, of various observables on these correlation lengths is differently strong. And so for example, when you look at the net proton uh, event by event fluctuation distribution and calculate its cum cumulants. The third cumulant goes with the power of 4.5. The fourth cumulant goes with the power seven of the correlation length. So you can try to zero in on these critical correlation lengths growth effects by looking at, specify, uh, at specifically tailored uh, observables. And there is a non-monotonic beam emitter dependence uh, predicted for normalized cumulants. And it's been proposed that this would be a telltale signature of the QCD critical point. Um, to, I will I'll spend a little bit of time here to give you an idea of how this all works. So we have a phase transition that separates quark gluon plasma from hadron gas, which is a smooth crossover phase transition until you hit a critical point. And after that, it turns into a first order, uh, into a first order phase transition. Um, there is critical dynamics on around the critical point, which affects a certain region around the critical point. And these dotted lines are illustrations of lines where the contour, uh, where the where the correlation length is constant. And so here the correlation length is big, and here the correlation length is small, and out here the correlation length is not. There is no critical contribution to the correlation length. This line here is an indication of the chemical freeze out line. So this tells you at which temperature versus chemical potential, uh, the, 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 the chemical abundances freeze out. And this line intersects this surface of correlation lengths at different points. And this one point is the one where it has, where it experienced the correlation length, all the other points, it has lower values of the correlation length. When you combine this with an overall sign change of the fourth order cumulant on either side of the um, critical point, you get a prediction that the normalized fourth order cumulant should have a non-monotonic beam energy dependence because as you change the beam energy, you move along this line like that from, Low, from high, uh, lower beam energy to higher beam energy, from higher beam energy to lower beam energy like that. And so two key aspects um, uh, or one key aspect needs to be emphasized here that these critical fluctuations um, equilibrate at a rate that is proportional to their correlation lengths. In other words, when the correlation length gets big, the time scale that takes these correlations to thermalize also gets long. This is called critical slowing down. So these, these fluctuations thermalize more and more slowly, the larger the correlation length gets, the closer you get to the critical point. And since the matter that's created in the heavy ion collision evolves at a very rapid clip, um, and undergoes very rapid expansion, uh, ra very rapid change of temperature and chemical potential by expansion, uh, these off equilibrium fluctuations uh, cannot thermalize in heavy ion collisions and the off equilibrium effects become absolutely essential. You can say it in a different way. If, if critical slowing down wouldn't happen and all of the critical fluctuations would very rapidly thermalize such just as any other fluctuation, thermal fluctuation, that by the time the heavy ion collision decouples into hadrons, all memory of critical fluctuations would have been lost. 
So the only way we can ever hope to see critical fluctuation effects is by banking on the fact that they do not thermalize, that they go out of equilibrium. On the other hand, the fact that the, the growth of the critical fluctuations near the critical point is slowed down also means that the critical fluctuations never become as big as they could become in thermal, if they reach thermal equilibrium near the critical point. So the critic, as the system passes by the critical point, the critical fluctuations start to grow, but they don't grow infinite, they grow to some limited value. And then as the system recedes from the critical point, the critical fluctuations start to come down again, but they don't go all the way back to zero by the time the system freezes out. And that's what we are trying to explore. And so um, what we have done here is we have used the Hydro Plus framework that was developed by Stefanov and Yin to uh, couple the dynamics of critical fluctuations to the beam energy scan uh, hydrodynamics uh, code and, and check out the evolution of the effects of the dynamical evolution of the medium on the dynamical evolution of the critical fluctuations. And we studied the slowest mode in the system that's created, uh, that's, that's caused by the fluctuations in specific entropy, entropy per net barrier on this, uh, following this uh, work here. So the way you do that is you introduce a phase-based density for the slow degrees of freedom, which is a kind of Wigner uh, distribution. It depends on position and Q, which is the relative momentum of a, uh, canonically conjugate to the separation of the two points in space, where I look at this slow mode S over N, or rather its fluctuation. And, um, there is, length, there is a length scale associated with the variation of this quantity on its location. That variation happens with a macroscopic length scale, which is the so-called homogeneity length of the expanding fireball. You can think of it as the Hubble volume of the fireball. And then there is a, a, a variation associated with the relative displacement of the two points, and that's controlled by the correlation length. And by Fourier transformation, the, this correlation length becomes the natural scale on which uh, critical fluctuate, uh, critical, um, on, on which wavelengths that undergo critical uh, criticality uh, separate from, from other wavelengths that do not undergo criticality. And in Hydro Plus, you assume that there is a scale separation between the uh, with, between the correlation length, which has to be smaller than the Hubble volume of the fireball. And in the hydrodynamic limit or zero long wavelengths limit, uh, the critical, the, the, uh, this Wigner this function will take on an equilibrium value, which is given by the ratio of the specific heat at constant pressure divided by the baryon density squared. These quantities evolve as a function of time because the medium, the density, the baryon density and the temperature evolves. So this is a moving target against which this quantity, towards which this uh, quantity wants to evolve, uh, but it never quite can. And, uh, and this is what the equilibrium value is away from the critical point. And this is what the equilibrium value is when you get close to the critical point. There is a critical enhancement factor with psi squared here. And there is also a momentum dependence, uh, wave, uh, wave number dependence for these fluctuations, which also comes for, uh, is, coupled from, um, is coupled with the correlation length. Okay, so the slow mode equations of motion have this relaxation time form that, uh, that, that I showed you before for the baryon diffusion current, the form of the equation for the, for the critical fluctuations is the same with a thermalization rate gamma Q, um, which has a medium dependence, which are the green factors here. So it changes as the temperature and the baryon density changes. It has a critical enhancement or uh, rather suppression uh, through these psi factors here. And it has momentum dependence uh, through this additional factor here, this Kawasaki form here. And so you can see that when I get close to the critical point and the correlation length grows, the um, relaxation rate shrinks and uh, this, the, the dynamics gets slowed down. This is what's called critical slowing down. And also very long wavelength modes uh, get damped or thermalized very slowly. 
The dynamics is controlled by the competition between the macroscopic expansion, which is controlled by the hydrodynamic scalar expansion rate here, and the microscopic relaxation processes, which are reflected in this, uh, in this rate gamma Q. And uh, the ratio of these forms the so-called Knudsen number theta over gamma Q, and moles with large critical Knudsen numbers will lag behind and fall out of equilibrium, and modes with small Knudsen number will be able to equilibrate. Um, now, when the system has non-equilibrium fluctuations, um, which evolve slowly, two things can, must be said. First, we have to con control that evolution separately from the hydrodynamic evolution. So they, we have to follow these fluctuations individually. We cannot lump them into a bulk viscous pressure correction or something like that. That's what hydro, hydro, hydro plus does, but it also keeps the system from completely maximizing its entropy. There is a non-equilibrium contribution to the entropy from these non-equilibrium uh, fluctuations, delta S, which is negative. Uh, and it's given by this function here. And uh, only when the uh, critical fluctuations have time to completely thermalize, then this delta S goes to zero and you go to the fully equilibrated stage. Um, these off equilibrium uh, contributions modify the inverse temperature and the chemical potential of the bulk medium by some uh, corrections that you can calculate. And they, uh, by the first, uh, for, by the fundamental theorem of thermodynamics, this can be translated into an additional contribution to the pressure, the so called back reaction of the non equilibrium slow mode dynamics on the bulk, because the pressure gradients it is what causes the hydrodynamic flow. And so, if you have large corrections to the bulk uh, pressure from these off equilibrium effects, you might worry about. Uh, these significantly changing the hydrodynamic flow, and we will we will study that. Okay, I'm running out of time. Um, uh, you tell me what what's more important to spend the time on really making people understand what's going on. I have I think four more, yeah five more slides here, or rushing. Through. I would say go go with the slides and uh, just try okay. to explain things. Right. Okay, so we did a study where we uh, took ideal groups of flow as a background hydrodynamic flow. So it's not a fully coupled uh, calculation of hydro plus with the fluctuations, but you, you, you calculate the dynamics of the fluctuations on a prescribed hydrodynamic flow, which has the advantage of being calculable and semi-analytically and a lot of checks, uh, you can do a lot of checks easily. And we, we haven't uh, allowed the groups of flow to be modified by back reaction, but we have estimated the back reaction effects. And so here is the parameterization of the, uh, of the correlation length that we use. It peaks at a temperature of 160 MeV. This is taken from some, some papers. Uh, here is described how we parameterize the uh, thermal heat conduction and the, uh, the heat capacity. And, uh, and the Gupsa flow by, by fiat because of uh, the imposition of, uh, uh, of conformal invariance, it evolves the system at constant mu over t. So mu over t never changes. It, the, the, the mu over t is constant along the trajectories. And so here is the temperature profile as a function of radius initially or at one frame over C, and then it shows how it evolves at later times. So the temperature decreases and uh, eventually the entire matter falls below the the critical temperature of 160 MeV. Here is the expansion rate that drives the, high, the, the evolution of the uh, critical modes. It's large initially and it drops as a function of time because the longitudinal expansion rate drops, but then transverse expansion picks up and also and even increases the, uh, the expansion rate again at larger radii. And here is the correlation length as a function of R, it peaks at TC. So here, um, this point is at TC. So at that time, the peak is located here. Then as the matter cools and the point of TC moves further inward, the peak of the correlation happens at an further inward and here. And then at this point, uh, you cross the phase transition completely and below there is no peak anymore. So uh, the co correlation length is not peaked anymore at late times. 
And so now we look at what happens to the um, uh, to the um, critical fluctuations, and we look at two critical fluctuation modes: one uh, with very small wave number. Uh, remember, this is a small wave number, as I said, uh, thermalized slowly. One with larger wave number, about one inverse Fermi, 1.2 inverse Fermi. Uh, you see, by looking at the Knudsen number, that the long wavelength mode, the, the more, small q, has very large Knudsen numbers, hundreds of units of Knudsen number, which means it thermalizes it's very, very far away from being able, able to thermalize. Whereas this mode, which is a wave number that's shorter than the correlation length, basically, uh, first of all, it has Knudsen numbers less than one, much less than one. And so you, it's, it's much more able to follow the, uh, to thermalize. And you see that when you, when you compare the evolution of the equilibrium value of the uh, of the uh, fluctuations with the actual non-equilibrium evolution, then you see in this case, there is no similarity whatsoever. The equilibrium value would have a peak that moves inward and the actual peak moves outward. And this outward moving peak is caused by um, advection by radial transverse flow. And the, the radial transverse flow pushes the peak, the correlating correlation peak out faster than the thermalization can pull it in. Whereas if you go to the, um, to the short wavelength mode, here is what it would do in equilibrium and here is what it does in real life. And you see it kind of follows the equilibrium by dynamics, but it's, it's uh, contaminated by, uh, by um, uh, critical slowing down. Um, let me see, did I say everything? So for small Q modes, thermalization is slow and advection wins over the relaxation. And that's in the upper row. And for large Q modes, uh, the thermalization wins over, over advection and the system moves closer to equilibrium. Now let's look at the feedback. Um, there, there is a number of effects that one can study here. One is the effect of advection uh, symbolized here by the radial flow UR. One is the effect coming from criticality symbolized here by the plug size. And the third is the, sorry, and the third is the evolution of the medium, which is indicated by green here. And you can turn them off individually. And we have done that in the paper. When you combine all of them, you get this picture. It plots here. What we plot is in the time space, in the space time diagram where this is a line of 160 MeV temperature. This is a line of 220 MeV temperature. And this is a line of 100 MeV temperature roughly. Uh, so here is where, your, where our critical behavior sits in the way we have parameterized it. And you see that the, uh, the non-equilibrium contribution delta S, which is negative everywhere, is largest where you have criticality, but even there, you have to multiply it with 10 to the four in order to make it visible. If you plot it in units of the equilibrium entropy density, the, 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 the contribution to the, to the entropy density coming from the off equilibrium critical dynamics is a relative order 10 to the minus four. And so that justifies of calculating uh, the procedure that we have done here, namely calculating the hydrodynamic medium without considering the back reaction, because the back reaction would lead to very small effects on the fluid itself. We also did a study where we, where we deformed the Gupsa profile uh, um, with anisotropic uh, deformations, uh, epsilon n, following papers by Hatta and collaborators, where you have a spatial cosine n phi uh, deviation. I'm showing you the elliptic deformation here, the cosine two phi, and the, the color contours give you the density distribution. It's now elliptic, not spherical in the transverse plane. Uh, different colors are different temperatures and the arrows show flow velocities. And then this shows for, uh, uh, for a non-equilibrium fluctuating mode with this wave number of one inverse Fermi, 
And without critical enhancement, it shows you where you the, where is the maximum of equilibrium if entropy correction. And it's coming here, which happen to be the regions of ra la ra largest expansion rate. So the expansion rate makes the system go out of equilibrium most. But when you look again at the scale, it's a very small scale. If you turn on criticality, then the then the off equilibrium effects are focused on this line of critical temperature. And so this, these peaks get shrunk to little bumps here on the, on the peak. But again, the order of magnitude is the same, 10 to the minus four effect. And when you then calculate the effect of on the elliptic eccentricity, it's uh, less than 10 to the minus four relative importance. So again, you don't have to worry about the, high, the, the feedback of the critical uh, fluctuations on the hydrodynamic medium to, to modify any of the parameters that you understand uh, as driving forces for anisotropic flow. Um, I'll just quickly go over that. We checked where the hydrodynamic framework breaks down. It breaks down when the product of the correlation length and the expansion rate becomes large. Uh, that's so. So when when this hierarchy between the homogeneity length and the critical length is no longer justified, and in this plot we plot this quantity as a color point, and you see these are the regions where it's largest. So so right in the neighborhood of the um, of the critical point, uh, the hydroplast framework gets stressed. But when you go away from the critical point, it very quickly gets into a region where it's no longer stressed and it's, it's a perfectly viable approach. So these are the conclusions uh, in two parts here. Um, the first part is the effects of the, the, the additional effects that, that need to be taken into account at lower energies because of the transport of net barrier density. Uh, we, it requires 3D, 3D dynamical initialization. It requires EOS and transport coefficients at non-zero conserved charge densities. And a lot of uh, progress has been made, but a big uh, uncertainty remains and that's related to baryon stopping and the three-dimensional initial condition for the baryon density. Without resolving this, um, it's hard to make progress. And it's very hard to, resolve this on a purely theoretical basis, but it's also not clear what, to me at least, what would be the phenomenological consequences that could be used to unambiguously zero in on this initial condition. So I see, see this as a big screaming problem that we should all uh, be working on. Uh, baryon diffusion affects specifically baryon observables. It does non-baryonic observables, for example, charge multiplicity are completely insensitive to baryon diffusion, but baryon uh, rapidity distribution, baryon transverse flow, baryon anisotropic flow, uh, all of these are very crucially expected by baryon diffusion, and therefore it needs to be discussed. It needs to be included in the dynamics, and Bess Hydro can do that. In the for the fluctuation dynamics, I think an important insight that we got from there is back reaction effects are small. And so you can solve this problem sequentially. You can first calibrate your hydrodynamic model off the critical point um, and uh, determine all the transport coefficients uh, away from criticality, and then take this model and move and, and add to it the slow modes to describe the dynamics near the critical point. And then you don't have to worry about the, these critical fluctuations screwing up your um, calibration of the background flow that you did before. But the dynamics of, um, of these critical fluctuations is interesting. It's controlled by this competition between uh, advection and relaxation, between expansion and thermalization. And a critical slowing out makes, uh, plays a key role. And it's actually the fundamental mechanism which makes, which will eventually make the critical point visible to the experimentalists. Without critical slowing down, you would never see it. Thank you. Okay. Ah, okay. Thank that. you very much. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Now we will have some uh, time for questions. And um, I think there is a question from Boris Tomashi. Do you want to ask it yourself? <laughs> 
Yes, hello, thank you. Thank you very much. So this is maybe more like a comment to the first part where you discussed these different initial conditions. Um, we actually looked at different initial conditions recently, and one of those was your QMD initial condition, which was fed that into Evan by Evan 3 plus 1 hydro viscous, uh, the one of Yura Karpenko. And, um, and turns out that the EuroQMD tends to be too local in rapidity. So one of the things we look at was this R2 decorrelation measure of the, of the uh, anisotropic flows. And when you uh, say rapidity, do you mean space-time rapidity or momentum? Oh, I mean, eta, I mean, eta as it is measured. I mean, at 27 it's measured now. No, no, well, sorry. Okay. What is so, the, the eta that is measured is this is the pseudo rapidity. Yeah, is it, uh, is it, so, but so, what, yeah. what your QMD gives you is the initial space-time rapidity distribution. Yeah, yeah, of, sure. But 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 so so the observable is this R2, which which mm -hmm. correlates the the V2 at different rapidity or decorrelates the V2 at different rapidities. So you can look at that as an observable and simulate that in the model where, so, so one of those was your QMD initial conditions fed into viscous mm -hmm. event by event three plus one hydro. Now that leads to, to this R2, which drops too fast with uh -huh. rapid uh -huh. difference. Uh -huh. So it seems that the, you know, it's too local in rapidity. Whereas the other one was that we use this, this, this extended Glauber glissando as Piotr Bozek does that. And, and that, that was more, more better fitting data. I'm talking about 27 GeV data uh -huh. because, uh -huh. because this was yeah. measured also by 27. So it's, it's not exactly the same your QMD as you are using because you have this, you know, deposition over time, but, but it's your QMD. I, and we tr actually what, what we tested was that we, we, we prolonged the smearing because you do some smearing because mm -hmm. you have hadrons, you smear that and feed in the hydro. If we, if we smear that in, in rapidity more, then we got closer to data. But it was hard to imagine how you would smear that. Mm -hmm. so, so that's an interesting observer. Yes, that yes. You. Uh, yeah, thanks for that comment. And I, I'm aware of that, of course. Um, the, the problem that that I see, we have tried also to think about what, what could resolve these issues. The problem is, the, the basic problem is that what you measure is momentum rapidity. And the resulting, the final momentum rapidity is a folding of the initial space-time rapidity distribution with the rapidity dependent flow. And so you can trade changes in the spatial rapidity distribution with changes in the hydrodynamic response. Uh, for example, you can change the hydrodynamic response by changing the baryon diffusion effects. And so there is an ambiguity between uh, momentum and uh, coordinate space distributions in the initial condition, which so far we have not been able to resolve. Well, but, but but this is this was pi on v two, so I wonder how that is that that is affected by by baryon diffusion, and we looked at okay, what we also looked was initial decorrelation in in a spatial anisotropy actually mm -hmm. because you have you know the, the, the tilted firewall mm -hmm. and you can measure the really the spatial characteristic how that is decorrelated. And we have measured the decorrelation at the at the point where you have the sparticalization also. So uh -huh. when it's in the paper, do you see oh. how it evolves and how it is correlated? Okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. I should look at that paper more carefully then. Um, it, yeah. So that's 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 the question. What 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 can how can you use the available observables? to put more constraints on these initial conditions. And I'm, I haven't said that your QMD is the right model. I said, we, we have one model, which we, which we on purpose made different from Shen's model. And, uh, and the differences are big in the, in, in, in the evolution. Actually, surprisingly, the best model was the Trento with P equal to zero, which is supposed to work at high energies. And we haven't done the decorrelation with that, but that, that, that was very surprising. It wasn't supposed to work, but it just worked. Stefan will be happy to hear, hear that. <laughs> yes. Okay, I think we, we could probably safely move on to the next question from Scott Pratt. 
Hi, hi, Uli. I was wondering, I'd like to know your opinions about the, uh, what you think the prospects are for uh, hydrodynamic uh, description to describe the dynamics inside the phase, phase coexistence region. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, that's the final answer. I, Thank I, you. I, I really haven't thought about this to, to an extent where I could even answer that. But I see myself in your classes. You have interesting classes. <laughs> <laughs> okay um are there any other questions comments from uh, uh anybody else I, I i'm sorry escort uh, i hope that you kind of sorted out because there was no real answer. no i'm very i'm very i'm very happy because i think that's that's an important answer it means that some yeah, people yeah. need to need to start thinking about this. I it's very hard to imagine yes. uh, an, you know, an evolution that just somehow touches the critical point, but never goes south of the critical point. In fact, that it's pretty is, much impossible. Yeah, that, so. that, that, that is right. And um, I've, I've thought for quite a while that it should be easier to find the first order phase transition than the critical point. Yeah, but I mean, exactly, fluctuations are bigger, right? But so, exa exactly how, I don't know, because of how, how you problem. model it is the, is yeah. the real, real yeah. question, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, are there any other questions from the audience? Um, well, people are thinking, I actually had some very naive, maybe a little provocative question. Uh, when you're using hydro, basically first you have this little problem with uh, matching some particle to hydro and then basically at the end backwards. So the question is, what is the real benefit of using hydro? Why don't you just use, I don't know, kinetic theory of some particle dynamics model it's, and it's skip hydro completely? Yeah. The answer is easy. It's many orders of magnitude in computational power that you need to solve the system in phase space rather than in coordinate space. So the, sim the simplification from, th uh, from 3 plus 3 plus 1 to 3 plus 1 is enormous in terms of computational requirements. I see. Even for the low energy uh, collisions, that seem to be kind of in the opposite. The no, main, especially uh, since hydro works so poorly in that case, perhaps. And and the other the other problem, which is maybe even more important uh, conceptually, is that it would have to be a kinetic theory with different degrees of freedom in during different stages, and so you would probably have to work with something like quark gluonic like quasi particles in in the quark gluon plasma phase, and turn them into hadrons. And then you have to really follow the, the hadronization of the quarks and gluons into hadrons microscopically, which is a problem that um, many physicists have died on uh, trying to solve. And uh, in the hydrodynamic approach, you can hide it in the equation of state, which you can solve uh, near equilibrium on the lattice. And that's a huge simplification conceptually. OK, yeah, fair enough. Um... Any other questions from the audience uh, before, uh, before we move on to anything else? Um, let's see. I also have a question regarding the critical fluctuations. So essentially there is this hydroplast scheme which you, you're essentially now utilizing. And my understanding is that generically the effects are not that large on the hydro, but there could be still big effects on observable data. And do you know which observable data might be affected the most by that? Okay, so we are we are not I'm not we are not there yet to give you a quantitative answer, but the the, the logic is the following. Uh, and the way you observe the um, the the critical point is you measure these critical fluctuations in the final state. And in order to understand what these critical fluctuations in the final state tell you, you have to first simulate their evolution in a realistic fashion, because you cannot just simply take equilibrium onsets for the final state fluctuations. You have to account for the fact that the system is out of equilibrium at that point. And that's what the purpose of this study was. Um, and But the... You can, you can calculate the evolution of these critical fluctuations um, by solving these uh, um, slow mode evolution equations on top of the hydrodynamic evolution, which is the hydro plus framework. Now, how these fluctuations then manifest themselves in, uh, in experimental observables uh, 
and how the details of their previous non-equilibrium evolution uh, affects these final state observers, we don't know yet because we haven't done the simulations yet. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, I don't see any other questions from the audience at the moment, so I want to use this opportunity to thank Uli for a very nice presentation. Uh, it was really very, very heavy work to uh, summarize here, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming and listening to me. <laughs>